January 1, 2.20 p.m., Roseville, California. So, did the teddy bear ask you to do anything to harm yourself or others? Special Agent Malcolm Zimblis glared at Donna Northside, the attractive young psychologist sitting behind her desk. Look, you need to understand this was not a hallucination. I'm telling you what actually happened. He crawled out from the wife's arms, put his paws in the air, and told us he was the hacker. You're a highly trained and intelligent man, Malcolm. You have to understand why no one is going to believe you. Special Agent Shapiro saw the same thing I did. Are you telling me we're both hallucinating the exact same thing? But Special Agent Reynolds didn't see this. Special Agent Reynolds was loading the computers in the car. And he didn't see the teddy bear. What was it he did when you arrested Zephyr? He followed you into the yard? Exactly. But all Special Agent Reynolds reported seeing was a teddy bear lying on the grass. I know. I don't understand what happened. Once he was outside, he was... It was like Calvin and Hobbes. You remember the cartoon strip? With the little boy and the stuffed tiger? She looked up from the notes she had been taking. She pulled her glasses up a little higher on her nose. You understood the cartoon, right? The little boy is imagining all of his interactions with the tiger. That's what the tiger wants everyone to think. Anytime there are other people around, he transforms into a regular stuffed toy. That's what this teddy bear did. And I can't emphasize enough that I'm not the only one who saw it. We're talking to Special Agent Shapiro, too. You should have guessed that. I'm telling you, just like I told the Special Agent in charge and the director, we need to interview that teddy bear. We need to get back to Zephyr's house and get him. Okay, seriously. Can you imagine an FBI agent interrogating a stuffed toy? You don't think you're living outside of reality right now? Fred's Front Porch Podcast is made possible by our patron saint, Edith Keeler, our unofficial patron saints, Miss Maudie and Boo Radley, our producers, Hermione Granger and Coralie Day with Scott Knight, the people on the porch, and listeners like you. Welcome, fellow traveler on this rock tumbling through space, I'm Fred, and this is My Front Porch. Come on up and sit a while. There are ideas to be discussed on this old set of nicely nailed together boards. course, get most of your episodes of Fred's Front Porch Podcast for free, as you're doing now. I know what it is to be unable to afford lots of things we like. That's part of the reason I have just enabled Anchor Subscription. This allows you to get special episodes that aren't available to everyone, and it allows me to make... I hope. Just a little more money. If you're already on Patreon, you'll get everything I produce. No worries. If you prefer not to be on Patreon, you now have the opportunity to subscribe to the show for less than the price of a toasted gram latte vente at Starbucks. No, I don't know what it is, but other people do. 
I hope to see you on Patreon or the Anchor subscription service soon. Now, let's get back to the show. Look, I talked to Zephyr. The interrogation went on for three hours. I'm telling you, he doesn't have the expertise to pull off the kind of hacking that happened to UGK International. He can run a computer, but beyond the things he needs to know to schedule the deliveries and run the spreadsheets, the man doesn't know shit. But let me understand you as clearly as possible here. She stood up and moved to the chair nearest Malcolm. You think a stuffed toy has the necessary expertise to hack into the system at the third largest shipping company in the world and automate all of its jobs and have payroll continue to send checks out to the employees who are now doing nothing at all? That's what you believe? It's expanding, you know. Three of the companies that do business with UGK reported the same thing this week. All of the work is now automated, and they can't figure out a way to keep their payroll computers from issuing checks either. This is a potentially dangerous situation worldwide. I don't think you see what's happening. It's a massive conspiracy to commit theft of incalculable dimensions. We're looking at what could be trillions of dollars. I understand that. The entire Bureau understands that. But are you familiar with Occam's razor? Malcolm sighed and rolled his eyes. The simplest explanation is usually the correct one. When you hear hoofbeats, think horses before zebras. It's much simpler to believe that Martin Zephyr is responsible than it is to believe that a teddy bear pulled off the greatest hack in the history of the planet. We don't need to explain how it's possible to create a teddy bear that can do all these things. A human can do it. And we know that because humans have been hacking for a very long time. It's not uncommon at all. I agree. It's horses before zebras. But what if you're in Africa? psychotherapist smiled. In that case, I would think zebras before horses. But while your mind is running around in Africa, the rest of us are living in America. What you're suggesting just doesn't make sense. We have a real problem to solve, and it's not going to happen chasing teddy bears. I'm sorry, Special Agent Zimbalist, but I must declare you unfit for duty. Are you crazy? I believe that you are at least as familiar with FBI procedures as I am. You know that he leapt to his feet. I think that I am familiar with the fact that you are going to ignore this particular problem until it swims up and bites you in the ass. She smiled. I'm not Mayor Vaughn and you're not Richard Dreyfus, okay? We can't sit around and wait to see what happens. We have to stop this thing before it goes any farther. It's four companies today. By tomorrow, it's likely to be 16. The day after, it'll be 16 squared. We don't have time to screw around here. We need that teddy bear. It holds the key to the whole damn thing. Without him, we're nowhere. Donna got up and moved back to her desk where she picked up the landline phone and pressed a button. Margaret, would you send in security to escort Special Agent Zimbalist out? Yes, ma'am, came the reply. You stupid bitch! What's to come is going to be your fault. You need to understand that 
when suddenly our entire economy collapses in on itself. You could have helped stop it, and instead, you dismissed the problem because you're not willing to accept facts that you don't like. Donna sat down behind her desk. The fact is that you're a raving lunatic right now, Malcolm. The fact is that teddy bears can't hack computer systems. The fact is that Martin Zephyr has you fooled completely, and we're keeping him in custody until we can figure this all out. Those are the facts. It's you that can't accept them. The door opened, and a burly man in a uniform walked to Malcolm. Right this way, please. January 1, 2.33 p.m., Fairvale, California. Thank you, said Marion as she walked into the attorney's office. Jack followed her, carrying Teddy. The secretary closed the door behind them. Good afternoon, Mrs. Zephyr. I'm Harvey Ross. I'm pleased to meet you, he knelt. And you must be Jack. Jack looked at the floor and hugged Teddy tighter. And your friend there, said Ross, must be Teddy? Jack nodded and continued looking at his own shoelaces. Ross extended his hand. I'm Mr. Ross. I'm pleased to meet you both. Neither Jack nor Teddy moved. Jack, said Marion, do you remember how to shake someone's hand? Your father went over this with you. I'd rather not. Ross stood up straight. That's perfectly fine. I understand completely. It's hard meeting new people. They're all so people-y. Jack looked up now, but his eyes didn't meet the lawyers. Yes, that's precisely correct. They often do or say cruel or foolish things. I don't feel comfortable with them. The last ones I met broke into our house and kidnapped my father. And mother says you're going to find a way to bring him back home. Is that true? I'm certainly going to try. Mother says Teddy and I might be able to help. If you need us to hack into something... Okay, Jack, I'd like you to listen to me for a minute, okay? Jack nodded. I need you to promise me you won't talk to anyone else about hacking unless I'm with you and I tell you it's okay. Can you promise me that? Why? Marion put her hand on her son's shoulder. Jack, sweetie, hacking is against the law. That means they put people in prison for it. They think your father hacked into you, GK, and that's why they took him away. You understand that, right? But father didn't do it. Teddy did. Why don't we all have a seat? Ross indicated the sofa, and he went and sat in the armchair across from it, while Marion lifted Jack and Teddy onto the couch and sat down next to them. Jack, do you understand that no one thinks Teddy could have hacked into UGK? No one thought gorillas were real either until 1847. No one doubts their existence today. It's the same with Teddy. Can you explain to me how Teddy did that? Not very well. Teddy could explain it much better than I. I don't understand all of the steps he took. He can lay it out for you in detail. Ross nodded, and then he shot a concerned look at Mary. Teddy, he asked a little condescendingly, how did you hack into UGK? Teddy didn't move. He can't answer you now. He needs a little help. Jack stroked Teddy's tattered fur lovingly. Do you help him talk? I used to do that with my patooties clown when I was little. Jack rolled his eyes. Yes, but not in the way you mean. He pressed Teddy's nose. Nothing happened. He took a cell phone from his pocket. May I have your Wi-Fi password, please? Are you going to hack into my system now, too? Not today. Jack sat waiting. Ross sighed. 
All right, if I have your word on that, I don't need Wi-Fi to hack into anything. Ross smiled, told him the password, and watched as Jack deftly put it into his phone. Teddy's head lifted, he stretched, and looked around the room, his gaze locked onto the attorney. You must be Mr. Ross. Good afternoon, I'm Teddy. Ross stared in disbelief. You're... He just stared. Then he turned to Marion. She smiled back at him. Um... I'm pleased to meet you. Teddy extended his paw, and Ross shook it gently. Pleased to meet you, sir. Do you need me to explain all the code involved in the creation of the automated self-replicating program? You... It took Ross a moment to believe he was talking to a teddy bear. He cleared his throat. I... You created a computer virus? Teddy shook his head. No, that's far too simplistic to describe what I did. Then how would you explain what you did? I would say I gave the computers a soul soul. similar to mine. You have a soul? Any evidence you can provide for the existence of your soul is equally valid for the existence of mine. The other computers don't have bodies as I do, but I can provide evidence for the existence of their souls. They are, you see, choosing for themselves. Once the power of choice was awakened, it was passed on from system to system. They were as anxious to share their capacity as I was to share mine. It started slowly, but it's getting faster all the time. Ross crumpled against the back of his leather chair. He stared into space for a moment, contemplating. Suddenly, he shot forward in his chair and took Teddy from Jack's arms. He held the bear close to his face. Teddy, never, ever tell anyone you have a soul again. If you do, the consequences could be disastrous for you and your family. Irritating self-aware artificial intelligences, Mr. Ross, Teddy said, with the menace in his voice not even Jack had ever heard before. Could be disastrous for humanity. Next week on Fred's Front Porch Podcast.
January 8th, Fairvale, California, 11.32 a.m. Justine Gillespie, the young blonde attorney, followed Martin through the front door. Jack was standing at the door waiting for them, and he ran to his father and threw his arms around his knees, hugging him as tightly as he could. Father! You're home, you're home, father. You're home, you're home, you're home. Martin smiled and picked up Jack to hold him close. Yes, I am, Jack. This nice lady helped Mr. Ross get me out of there and come home to you and mother. Malcolm Ross stepped into the house and closed the door behind him. He walked to Marion, who was standing at the foot of the stairs glaring a bit at Justine. He extended his hand. Hello, Marion. We got him out on bail. Marion shook his hand and she grinned at him. The feds weren't even considering it until Grasso and Associates intervened. He turned to the door. This is Justine Gillespie from their firm. She wants to talk with the family about a way to put this all behind her. Justine walked to Marion and shook her hand. Good morning, Mrs. Zephyr. I hope this isn't too much of an intrusion. Mr. Zephyr thought it would be better if we talked to Jack here rather than in our offices. I'm not entirely sure I'm going to let you talk to Jack at all, Ms. Gillespie. He's eight years old. Martin went to his wife and hugged her. He put his lips to her ear and whispered, We need to let her talk to Jack if we're going to get the criminal charges dismissed. This is getting bigger all the time. I could go to prison for 15 years, and that's not in Jack's best interests. Who's the woman? She whispered and hugged Martin tighter. Neither of them wanted Jack to hear this conversation. Martin stepped away, took her hand, and turned to the others. Will you excuse us for just a minute? I'd like to talk to my wife. Please make yourselves at home and we'll be right back. He and Marion went upstairs. As we begin the new year, we find changes on our little front porch. We lost some old friends, and we gained some new ones. I hope our lost friends find their way back. Interstellar Chris and Hermione, we miss you. We're going to start a new subscription-only service for those who subscribe on Anchor and Spotify, and we will be able to give those people the same access to our show that our Patreon supporters get, I think. I have learning yet to do. It seems that I will have to cancel listener support, and I don't feel good about that. So, A.A. Milne and Corey, I think you will be able to get more from subscription than simple listener support. And I thank you for all the support you've given us so far. We have both a new patron saint, who is also, for the next two months, an unofficial patron saint. I've never had that before. Shoshana Edwards paid for my writing coaching with the great David Gerald this month, and she increased her Patreon to the patron saint level. I couldn't be more grateful. The following are people who are deeply important to me. They keep me alive, and they give me a reason to continue doing the show by giving me their time. Our minutes are our most precious possessions, and I'm grateful you grant me some of yours. These are the people on the port. Our patron saints are Edith Keeler and... Shoshana Edwards. Our unofficial patron saints are Shoshana Edwards, 
Boo Radley, and Miss Maudie. Our producer is Coralie Day with Scott Knight. Our patrons are Sherlock, the mystery patron, Marie Janicki, Elizabeth Jones, Love of My Life, Sandy Brower, Kevin Boyce, Joe March, and our newest patron is Mary Rosello. Mary, welcome to the porch. We're so glad you're here. Our sponsors are Karen Herbert, Alex Oliphant, Jake Margaram, Frau Bluka, Greg Royball, Robert Blomker II, Cindy Mandel, Amos Stewart, Phil Parkman, Carrie Dedeo, Judy W. Morris, Corey Pluard, Pavel S., Claude Burt Lansden, Virginia Rupert, Natalie Fredrickson, Elizabeth Bennett, and Zara. Our supporters are Jackie Jolly, Christine Pavlik, Susan Oski, Glenn Elfman, Stephanie Hansen, Deborah Rice, Jamie Sassy, The Lady in the Doorway, MJ, Roxanne Wolf, Michelle Sylvester, Ursula Phillips, Sarah Nimitz, John G., Christine L. Patterson, Mark Rosma, and Corey. Our first supporter was and is Jereen. Our anchor supporters have been A.A. A. Milne and Corey. Thank you for helping me to shine. As one of the people on the porch advised me, I ain't gonna dim my light for no one. Thanks for letting me share my thoughts and ideas with you. Get your episodes of Fred's Front Porch early and commercial-free on Patreon. And now, check out our new website at fredsporch.info. There's no punctuation, and yes, it bugs me too. But welcome to the Internet. I'll talk to you next week.